this video is um, going to be about the Sinclair ZX81. So this computer was launched March 5th, uh, 1981, right? So hence you got the, the 81 there. Um, and uh, the amazing thing about it was um, how much cheaper it was than other computers on the market at the time. Um, it was, uh, I think I want to say, £79 assembled. Um, and every other computer, like App, uh, the Apple II or others, were there were hundreds and hundreds of pounds to buy. Um, so this was really the only way for lots of people to get into uh, computing uh, in the 80s, in the early 80s at least. Um, and I had one of these. This was um, this type of machine uh, was was my first computer. This isn't the actual one, but it's it's identical to the one that I got when I was uh, when I was uh, eight years old. Um, and I put my own money towards it as well. I had to I had to take all my savings out of my post office account to buy it. Um, the reason I was excited about it is just learning how to work a computer, learning how to program. Um, and I, I wanted to buy one of these uh, a few years ago now. I didn't have one anymore. Um, so I went on eBay. I found uh, I found one that I really wanted and I lost out on it. Um, in the like fat last few seconds of the auction, somebody bid, you know, a uh, dollar more than me. Um, so I lost out. Um, and then I immediately went bid my losing amount on three lots and then I won them all. So I ended up with actually four um, and I actually sent two of them uh, to Dave Jones of the EEV blog uh, in Australia and um, he actually covered them on, on what is a link. I'll put a link up uh, and you can see that. And um, one of the things he said is that this was a rubbish computer and there were so many better computers around, but it, he kind of, Dave, you missed the point. There were so few ways, I mean, as a, as a kid, I was never getting an Apple II and it was my introduction to, to programming. Today I'm gonna I'm actually gonna make a video about repairing one of these, um, but we're gonna repair one of the ones, one of the other ones that I bought online, which is this one, and this is a Timex uh, Sinclair 1000, which is basically a ZX81 that's been rebadged by Timex. So this one, uh, this one would have been made in Dundee. Um, uh, yep, well in the UK, these were made uh, in Timex's Dundee factory. Um, and then Timex would uh, rebadge re them, and these were sold all over the world. Uh, um, this one is a United. I think this would have, would have been sold in the United States, because it has this channel two, channel three, um, uh, so it would work with um, N NTSC. This one's actually manufactured in France, interestingly enough. Anyway, this one. Um, this is the post-it note that um, I took off it um, a minute ago. Um, made in France. Um, it's. Keyboard flat flex is broken, uh, but it has a 210 ULA. So there's two models of ULA, which are the uncommitted logic arrays in these. And this is the good one. Uh, there's 180s. Uh, they were the very earliest ones. And those ULAs couldn't generate something called a back porch signal, or they didn't bother to generate one. Uh, and that meant that they wouldn't work. They would work on black and white TVs, but not on color TVs. So you want the 210 ULA, that's the good one. Um, so this, uh, uh, we're gonna take this apart. Notice that this is all metalized, right? And there's this, this is not, the, the ZX81 ones that were built in the UK didn't have this kind of metalized interior or this kind of, um, sh uh, this is, looks like a, a ground line that's supposed to connect with the inside of the case. You see the inside of the case is also metalized. My guess is so that this is for FCC uh, emissions regulations in the US. So uh, the flat flex is broken. Actually, you can see that really clearly there. Um, so we're not gonna use that. Um, this is the board that's inside. So um, this is the ULA. Uh, ULAs were made by Ferranti. Um, and this is the 210, uh, has 210E on it rather than 180. So that's the good one that just does generate a back porch. Uh, that, that's the Z80 CPU. This is the ROM and this is the RAM. So the um, Timex TS100s, sorry, TS1000s, had 2K of RAM, so they had, uh, the ZX81 just had 1K, uh, the um, the 2000, sorry, the TS1000 had 2K of RAM, and um, uh, so twice as much, um, but we're also gonna, um, I'm gonna replace this RAM chip, and we're gonna see if we can get it to 16K internally. But first, let's uh, take a look around, 
and let's see if we can power it up and uh, generate a composite signal. There is a composite signal that's coming out of the ULA. So we're basically going to we're going to disconnect um, this um, this board that's inside here, and we're going to rewire it a little bit. So the first order of business is going to be uh, to uh, we need to power it up and then see if we can get a video signal out of it. And because I don't have a television, uh, we need to make a composite a video signal. So um, the circuit that we're going to create, let me just quickly draw it here. So this is the circuit I'm going to create. Um, I'm not going to put this resistor in to begin with. Um, and we're going to, um, sorry, the, the, this transistor, the one that they recommend is something called the 2N3904. Let's see what happens when I turn this screen on. Fingers crossed. Yeah! Oh. So let's see if the keyword works. I think if I short some of these, I should get characters appealing. Yeah! Awesome. So looks like it's actually working. It's booted. That's clear and bright. Okay, so what I've done is I've removed this cable here that went into the, there and I've disconnected the UHF out um, so that I can reuse this connector for the, the composite. So the next step is uh, to uh, solder a wire to uh, the, the via that's just uh, labeled 2 on the board. Yeah, look at that. Okay. Okay, that is rock solid as well. Look, there's no lines. Sweet. Composite video out. Okay. Um, I guess I should put this little box back on the top. And then, then we're good to go. So, um, actually, this is what the uh, original RAM pack would go on the uh, uh, e external uh, connector here. And these were notorious for wobbling. Uh, RAM pack wobble was a problem. And um, when it wobbled, it would disconnect some of the pins and you'd lose all of your, your program, all of your work. So they made um, these. Uh, which were went along the whole back and then they had these little velcro. Can you see that? These little velcro connect uh, uh, pads So it would, like velcro to the back of the ZX uh, the ZX81. So um, I actually had one of these I have, These are 32k RAM chips. I have a few of them here um, and uh, These are 62256 um, RAM chips and they're all the same. These are all different manufacturers Alliance um, this is Cypress, and this is uh, some other manufacturer, I'm not, I'm not sure who. Um, I don't know if you can see this, this the original Toshiba chip there. Look at the, look at the, the Toshiba logo. It's kind of, it's kind of old-fashioned old style. So that's 2K of RAM. And there's already a socket there, which is um, big enough to fit this, but the problem is the pinouts aren't right. So we're going to take this out, replace it with this, and then we have to do some wiring to make it all work. So that's what the chip looks like. Um, now, um, there were three pins that we had to bend up um, and attach, and they were um, pin one. So I'm only going to talk about the changes you have to make so you can put this chip directly into the socket once you've bent up these pins uh, then it's pin uh, 26 
need to bend that pin up and pin 23. Now, for reference on the chip itself, these are, um, this is address line 14, this is address line 12, and this is address line 13. And what we need to do is connect those to, um, there's a set of diodes and they're actually labeled on the schematic, right? So each one of these diodes, uh, it's one, one to eight, and they're labeled Now, on this side of the pins, that's the keyboard connector. And various address lines go into these diodes. And you want to connect uh, A14. So this one connects down to D1. The next one, which is A13, connects to D3. and then A13 connects to D5 like that so, can you see that? I bent three pins up I'm actually going to put it in the socket now um, hopefully let fit in yeah that's a good fit alright so I have to find a way of connecting can you see these pins? I have to find a way of connecting these pins into the um, into the address lines. So I have this really fine. Uh, this is wire wrap wire. Um, so um, it's really fine wire, um, and I'm going to use it to kind of make these jumps. But I'm actually going to see if I can wire wrap on these uh, end endpoints. Wire rack makes a really good connection. I actually used to use it in uh, mainframes, uh, and it can make a better connection than solder at times. So, um, and the way that you do wire wrapping, can I figure this one out? Right, is you push the wire in like that. Can you see that? And then you put it around the pin, and then you t you spin this guy, and what it does is it keeps wrapping the wire around. There you go, it's totally wrapped on there. And um, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah. So uh, the reason it makes such a good connection is because the, the edges of these pins is quite, are quite sharp. And when each time you wrap the wire around, it, it, it kind of beds in a little bit. I'm actually gonna, so I'm gonna do this on, um, on all of them. No, that's fine. Okay, so there's my bodge wires. Um, hopefully they're they're not too long. Um, probably should have cut them a little bit shorter, but I think they're connected up pretty well. Okay, so I put the keyboard in and it didn't work. So I'm going to take these screws out again and see if I can uh, reseat this cable again. So I just want to check to see if there's continuity along this. So there's some sort of break on this line. And it's it's actually just it looks like um, the break is somewhere it's actually at the point where it would be folded to go in what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm actually gonna cut these cables just slightly shorter both of them and that will um, that should get past the break if I'm lucky so let's give that a shot Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. It's so good. P. Uh, 
shift. So now I want to uh, test and see if the uh, RAM expansion actually worked or not. So I'm going to quickly type in a test program. Sixteen K, yeah. So this is um, the book that came with the ZX eighty one, and um, I remember spending hours uh, looking at this, looking at this book, every page, and it's actually um, it's it's pretty interesting and it's quite well written, and it even has like. Um, Theory of operation. The, there's a picture that shows you the inside, like, of the ZX81, and kind of describing how um, how the different um, uh, components work. And um, I always thought this was really cool. I had never opened my ZX81 to look inside um, when I was a kid, um, but I thought it was cool to have a picture of what's going on on the inside. So I want to show you some of the amazing graphics because there's a section in the manual about graphics and Dave Jones said you know the resolution was really rubbish it was uh, 64 pixels by 44 um, so I just want to show you what this um, what this baby can do Are you ready to be amazed? This is real time. You know, I quite often speed up or slow down uh, videos, um, just you know, so we can skip over the the, the boring bit. Um, but this is this is you know thrilling. This is actually real time ZX81 drawing a sine wave. How's that for graphics? It's a sine wave. So this is Invaders. It's a game for the ZX81 that was written kind of recently. And uh, it uses this high-res mode. The, uh, people discovered that they could get higher-res graphics out of the ZX81 by tricking uh, the screen rendering algorithms to rendering parts of the ROM image. Uh, what's happening when it's rendering uh, characters is it's rendering characters out of the ROM and they figured out that they can get high-res uh, graphics by um, asking the, the, the rendering algorithms to just ren render bits of the ROM image. But you have to find a bit of the ROM that matches the thing you're trying to render. So these, these invaders actually look, they look pretty convincing. Um, um, something interesting happens when it goes from this screen, which is like a normal resolution, to the high-res screen. It seems to go into something, some sort of PAL mode. Um, but this is totally playable. It's it's actually pretty fast as well. The uh, it feels like Space Invaders, um, and it plays like Space Invaders. You can uh, shoot bullets and so forth. It's pretty nice. So thanks for watching. That's all for this video. Please leave a, uh, a comment below if you like, um, and I'll see you in the next video.